And since we've started this church uh, three years, a little over three years ago now, uh, one of the people that has been very instrumental uh, through his personal assistance, prayer, and support has been Jacob Prash. And so whenever Jacob's around, we like to have Jacob come and speak. And um, even though his, uh, you know, he's physically restrained a little bit, he's been able to make it here. And so we're going to listen to another hour of his teaching. So Jacob, have at it. Thank you so much, John. How long do I have? 12.30, got to finish? Uh, an hour. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I won't bore. Uh, <laughs> I, went I went five minutes over. I'm really well. Maya Maxima Cooper. How do you know what Maya Maxima Cooper is? Oh, a lot of ex-Catholics here. Yeah, Ex-Catholic? Oh, well, praise, and she became a Christian? Uh, yeah. Kind of. Well, she Catholic became a Christian. Yeah, Jesus cures mental illness. <laughs> 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 so we'll pray in Latin. I, I, I don't, I don't want to bore you with, uh, with Greek this time. This time I'm not going to bore you with Greek. I'll bore you with Hebrew instead. <laughs> Should we pray in Latin? <laughs> Who wants me? So she be at Dominus Sacrificium, the Manibus Tui, a lot of glorium nobinus Sui, a utilitatem coque nostrum, tos usque ecclesiae Sui Sante. Nome de Jesu Christe. That's what I like about those Catholics. You got the cash, they got the absolution. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Catholic people. My mother's family suffers from that infirmity. Be that as it may, my least favorite subject, at least one of my least favorite subjects, I don't like talking about this subject, but it's an unfortunate necessity for all of us. For every church that God's going to bless and grow, for every ministry, even for house groups, at some point this is going to happen. It is inescapable, it is unavoidable, and I don't like even having to take it into account, but the fact is it is reality. And it is something that God put in his word for a reason, and that reason is because it is a reality. What happens when godly believers, when good brethren, when good men, good women, saved Christians, people who love the Lord, people who are scripturally based, people who are serious about their faith, people who are serious about evangelism and discipleship, people who are serious about the return of Jesus, people who are serious about living morally in a, in a depraved age, what happens when godly people, godly Christians, godly men, godly women, what happens when good people disagree seriously and fall out? Not one goofball and one solid guy. What happens when two solid believers have a serious disagreement and fall out? There are people who will say things like, well, all we need to do is seek the Lord with love and humility. If we just came together, counted others better than ourselves, and prayed and loved and just sought the Lord, it would all work out. Yes and no. Sometimes it doesn't work out the way we thought it would. It might work out eventually. If you're really seeking Jesus, it'll work out eventually. But don't think the problem's going to be solved in the near term, necessarily. Now, if it's a case where one person is obviously scripturally right, or logically right, and the other person is off the wall, that's easy. It's easy. And when you have cases where two Good people disagree and they do seek the Lord and the Lord shows them, that's wonderful. It's a problem solved. But what happens when a church or a relationship between two believers or a ministry hits the wall of a sharp disagreement between two believers, both of whom love the Lord and are solid? Not one flake and one solid guy, 
two solid people, men, women, whatever. Let's deal with this uncomfortable issue. You have probably encountered it already at some point in your Christian life if you've been saved any length of time. If you've not been saved very long, it's inevitable you will at some point encounter this problem and needing to deal with it. It's easy when somebody is teaching or doing crazy things. I, we all know crazy situations. I know situations where somebody said, well, the Lord told me to divorce her and marry this other one. God does not tell you to do things that are contrary to his word. He doesn't tell you to do that. There was a case in England. I'm not making this up. You couldn't make it up. <laughs> Some guy announced from the pulpit, his wife was sitting there, and he announces from the pulpit that the Lord showed him his wife was going to go be with the Lord, quote, unquote, within six months, and this other woman in the church was going to be his new bride. That's how he told his, his wife she's about to check out. Well, six months later, she was alive and well. He accused her of having a spirit of rebellion and divorced her. <laughs> In a case like that, it's obvious who's right and who's wrong. There's no issue. But there are cases when it's not so obvious who's right or who's wrong. We do not know if the John Mark of the Book of Acts is the same Mark who was Peter's secretary. It's usually believed by most scholars that the Gospel of St. Mark is actually the Gospel of Peter. It's usually believed by most scholars, even conservative evangelical theologians tend to believe that. There are arguments within theological and historical circles is the John Mark of Acts the same Mark who was the ghostwriter for Peter? There is a dispute or academic debate. Nonetheless, let's see some of what we know about this young chap. Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When the angel sprung Peter from the joint and got him out of prison, he goes to the house of John Mark's mother. This guy had been around for some time. He was not an unknown quantity by any means. He was not an unknown quantity. Let's look at the book of Acts chapter 4, please. Verses 36 and 37. And Joseph a Levite of Cyprian, birth, who was also called Barnabas, by the apostle, which translated means son of encouragement. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Bar it's Aramaic, not Hebrew. Barnabas. And these two, we know, were related. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, and also Barnabas, cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. One caveat, one major problem you will always find and need to be aware of in dealing with conflict between believers and we're talking here good believers now, is when you have family relationships, objectivity 
is easily compromised. Objectivity can go out the window. Medical doctors are generally trained do not treat a close friend or a relative unless it is an emergency. Many people in the legal profession say do not represent as a client a relative, and if you do so, do so cautiously. It is very difficult to be objective when you are dealing with blood relations, family relations. Blood is thicker than water. I know two mission organizations, two mission organizations where havoc was wrecked because the people in the mission field had relatives on the mission board. <laughs> and if anybody disagreed with the policy, of the, it was like going against the family. It became a family enterprise. A family enterprise. Be careful of nepotism in the church. It can happen very easily. By God's design, blood is thicker than water. It's difficult not to take sides or to be objective when you're dealing with family. If it's a third party unrelated to you, it's easier to be objective. But when you're dealing with family, with relatives, objectivity becomes impinged. That's even true in the secular professions like medicine and law, and it's certainly true in the ministry. Everybody understand, be really, really careful, cautious of the fact that when you're dealing with family, objectivity becomes impinged in some way. All right, now let's begin dealing with the subject. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 13. The Holy Spirit said, set out for me, Barnabas and Saul. Notice Barnabas comes first. Saul is second. Barnabas initially, in this first dynamic mission team, Barnabas is named first, Paul second. Later, it becomes reversed. Barnabas is named second. Paul is named first. It becomes Paul and Barnabas, or here it is, Barnabas and Shaul, Shaul. Okay. Barnabas in his name implies a pastoral nature, ministry, and calling, son of encouragement. That's what pastors do. They're encouraging. They encourage the sheep. They groom people. They groom new believers and things of that nature. Barnabas was truly a pastoral person. Well, he was certainly good in the influence he had on Paul. Now let's understand this further. Verse 5. And when they reached Salmas and began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, they also had John as their helper. This John, John Mark, was there right from the beginning of the mission, of, of the first missionary journey. In verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga, which is Pergamum, in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Pergamum was a spiritually intense place. Jesus described it as the place where Satan's throne is. Let's un I've been to Pergamum many times. The capstones of the altar of Zeus are now in a museum in Berlin, but the altar foundation stone is still there. You have the Mithras worship from Egypt there. You have the emperor worship of Rome there, but you had Satan's throne. The, the altar of Zeus. Zeus was the Greek corruption of Theos, God. Theos is God in Greek. Zeus, they identified with the planet Jupiter, okay? The Romans came to identify with the planet Jupiter. 
the false religions of ancient Babylon that began in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis and reached an Old Testament apex in the Babylonian Empire. When the Persians, as prophesied by Isaiah, destroyed Babylon, the mystery religions of Babylon were transferred, they migrated from Babylon, they migrated westward to Pergamum. Literally, the 300 priests, literally 300 priests of Babylon, pagan priests of Babylon, 300, migrated west and set up shop in Pergamum. It became the new Babylon. The capital of the world's false religions moved from Babylon to Pergamum. Jesus said it's where Satan's throne is. It is from Pergamum that the mystery religions of ancient Babylon infiltrated, permeated the Greco-Roman world, okay? They came into the Greco-Roman world via Pergamum, but originally from Babylon. That's exactly how it happened. This can all be well documented with history and archaeology, but it's, and it fits what the scriptures describes. Pergamum is a spiritually heavy place. Once things on the first missionary journey begin getting heavy, this John Mark, who everybody knew, who his mother gave respite and refuge to Peter when he was freed by the angel from the, from the prison and so forth, he jumps ship. He takes off once things get tough. With this in view, turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 15. In Acts 15, you have the first church council. The issue of the law, the Torah, the circumcision of Gentiles is settled by the apostles. In theory, it is settled by the apostles. Now, this is one of those passages that prompted the Roman Catholic Church to put the scriptures on the index of banned books. When we read this, we see in verse 13, and after they stopped speaking, James, Jacob, answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related, that's Peter, how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles the people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, and they make citations from Amos and so forth. Verse 19, therefore it is my judgment. Verse 20, but that we write them. Okay. Then it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Notice the first church council. Peter played a role, but James was the primus inter paris, the first among equals. James presided, not Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, not Peter. At different points of church history in the book of Acts, different apostles functioned as the primus inter paris, the first among equals. Pentecost was obviously Peter. By Acts 15, it is James. Later, it's Paul. There'll always be a primus inter paris. The most scripturally correct model of ecclesiastical polity of church government is a plurality of elders. But even when you have a plurality of elders, you're going to have a senior pastor, you're going to have a primus into Paris, the first among equals, the one who presides. Okay. Parliamentary democracy is based on the idea of a prime minister, a primus into Paris. <laughs> okay. Now let's understand this. Why was Peter not presiding if he was the first pope? Why at the first church council did James say, brethren, listen to me? Why does James say, therefore, in verse 19, it is my judgment? How come he wasn't acknowledging the pontiff? Because the pontiff at that time was the pagan emperor, the pontificus maximus, the bridge builder between 
all of the pagan faiths of the empire. Now this, again, comes into play in the last days. The pope is the, wants to be the bridge builder, he wants to be the pontiff. You see, he has these convocations in Assisi, Italy, and Rome, and all these things, where he wants to bring the, the witch doctors and the Buddhist monks and <laughs> Zoroastrian priests together for some interfaith convocation. He only wants to be the bridge builder. This is exactly what happened in pagan Rome. The pontiff was the pagan emperor, the head of the pantheon of pagan Rome. That's what this is. Peter was not presiding. James was. If Peter was the pope, he would have been presiding. And there would not have been a magisterium. There would have been a papal encyclical. <laughs> Rome is spoken. This is one of the main passages that the Roman Catholic Church had it to react to in banning the scriptures. Well, this is a big problem. I think of Cardinal Manning. His parents were from Ireland, but he was a famous cardinal in the 19th century in London, where you had a large influx of Irish immigrants after the potato famine into England and, of course, into the United States. And he was known as the Cockney Cardinal, poor side of East London. And uh, he, uh, again, Irish Catholic. And in his autobiography, Cardinal Manning wrote the following. He said, in my 40 plus years as a Roman Catholic priest, I've known multiple reasons, multiple reasons why people became Roman Catholic. They were attracted by the liturgy or they wanted to marry somebody who was a Catholic. Multiple reasons. But he said, I've only known one reason why somebody would renounce the Roman Catholic faith and become an evangelical Protestant. He said, they read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and had more questions that no priest could answer. That's exactly what he said in his autobiography. <laughs> That's quite a, at least he was honest. The greatest English-speaking theologian of the 20th century in the Roman Catholic Church, their main one, was a former Protestant called John Henry Newman, who became a cardinal. In his treatise, Empire and State, he admits at least 70% of the rites, rituals, customs, and traditions of Roman Catholicism are of pagan origin. <laughs> hey, hey, notice. <laughs> Pergamum. <laughs> well, they have the first church council, and they supposedly settled the issue, only putting four requirements on non-Jewish Christians that some theologians think derive from the Noahide covenant, from Noah. Anyway, the conference is over, and the issue is, in theory, settled. What happens next? Verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. And Barnabas was desirous of taking John called Mark along with them also. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. And Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now look at Acts 15, verse 2. Unlike Acts 13, now it's not Barnabas and Saul, but Paul and Barnabas. In the dynamics of human relationships, not just sociologically, but even within the church, the junior partner, the underling, is going to grow in his faith and experience. The senior partner is going to have to accept he's not a kid anymore, or he's not a deputy anymore, or an adjutant anymore. 
he is somebody who God is going to bless and use in his own right. He may even develop giftings beyond my own in certain areas. This can create problems, can it? Just think of a family business, Jones and Sons. The old man teaches the kid, I don't know, the dry cleaning business or whatever. The old man taught the kid how to do the dry cleaning and press the suits and everything, and they built up a good business. Maybe they opened a couple of, a couple of stores. But now the kid gets some ideas. You know, uh, maybe we ought to do some custom tailoring. It's a new market. It's expanding. In addition to the traditional business, which is our bread and butter, maybe we can expand into custom tailoring. The old man says, we never did that before. It's a bad idea. The kid, no, I think it's a good. <laughs> These things happen. These things happen in human relationships. They happen in families. Well, they happen in churches. But the complication is he's a relative. Whenever you have a relative involved, once again, the first casualty is going to be objectivity, at least to a degree. It is very hard to maintain a balanced, neutral objective perspective when you're dealing with family. Next. Paul says, this guy bailed out when things got tough in Pergamum. Who knows what's going to happen next time? The first missionary journey was a trial run, and he couldn't handle it. Now, who knows where the Lord's going to lead us into this new turf. What's going to happen? This guy can't come. He bailed out on us. He can't handle it. He's not up to it. Barnabas says, yeah, but the kid has potential. He comes from a good family of believers. His mother was the one who gave shelter to Peter. He's, you know, I, I, look, he's related to me. I know, I know what a kid's heart. I've known him since he was little. He, he has potential. I, I, we got to get next to him and encourage him and give him another shot. Paul says, another shot, he might get a shot. You, you can't have this guy with us. <laughs> Who's right? Who's wrong? Who's right? Who's wrong? Now we can say, hypothetically, all we need to do is love each other, esteem others greater than ourselves in a spirit of Christian humility, come together and seek the Lord, and he'll show us how to handle this disagreement. <laughs> Don't you think Barnabas and Paul knew that? <laughs> they knew it as well as we did. But that's not how it played out, did it? That's not how it played out. Now, it's nice when it does play out that way, and sometimes it does. In some circumstances, it may work out that way, Praise the Lord when it does. But it doesn't always. Other books are hagiographic. They all try to imitate or counterfeit the scripture in some way, but they're hagiographic. The Book of Mormon tries to make Joseph Smith seem like a Christ-like figure. <laughs> doesn't tell you the truth about him, but he was a swindler. The Koran and the Hadith do the same with Muhammad. This doesn't tell you the truth. He was a pedophile. <laughs> you know, all of these things. But the scriptures are very realistic. The scriptures show you the truth about people. It says Elijah was a man like us. He was just <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, even well into their advanced years, there were fundamental flaws in their character that God was trying to work out. Because it teaches about us. Even in our advanced years, there's fundamental flaws in our character that God's trying to work out. The scripture, unlike these hagiographic counterfeits of it, such as the Koran or the Bhagavad Gita or the Book of Mormon or whatever, 
The scriptures are very realistic. They tell the truth about people. It shows their virtues and their weaknesses, their good points and their bad. It shows the reality of life for what it is. The Holy Spirit inspires this unfortunate account of a schism, of a split, in what had been the greatest missionary team that spawned other missionary teams, that spawned the church's mission in many respects, that spawned the fulfillment of the Great Commission, or certainly expanded it, or relaunched it, reframed it in many respects. But the Lord inspires by his spirit for the account of it to be put in Scripture. He doesn't try to cover it up the way the Mormons cover stuff up about Joseph Smith, or <laughs> the way the Hadith does about Muhammad. Just puts it there. Why does the Holy Spirit do that? Why did God put this in his word? Because if it can happen to Barnabas and Paul, if it can happen to apostles, these were men who saw Jesus. Physically, some way. If it happens to them, it can happen to us. If the apostles who saw Jesus, who are the foundation stones of the church, according to Ephesians 2, if it can happen to them, we'd be very foolish indeed to think it couldn't happen to us. Not only can it happen to us, at some point it very likely will. Or at least will be affected by it in some way. Let's see how this thing can work. Look with me, please, in Genesis 13. Let's begin at verse 6. The land could not sustain them while dwelling together. This is Lot with Abram. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. Then Abram, now don't, what a peculiar thing to insert there, that these pagans were in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. We are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me to the left, and I'll go to the right. To the right, I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, you go to Zohar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. One of the things in a church, in a congregation, that will engender this kind of problem, where you have differences of opinion, is growth is growth. It's because the flocks grew. Satan is going to attack any growing church. But growth creates as many problems as it solves. Now what a wonderful problem to have. You'd rather be in a church that God is blessing and that is growing than in a church that is shrinking. But when a church is shrinking, at least you know what you have to do. <laughs> we need to pull together and seek the Lord. Are we going to turn this around? Evangelism, whatever. At least you know what you got to do. But when the church is growing, when you have growth and blessing, that creates not only opportunities, but challenges and presents new problems that affect the relationships of people. Notice the strife was not between Abraham and Lot personally, but their herdsmen. 
other people get drawn into these kinds of divisions. There may be no problem between you and I, but your camp and my camp are having a problem. <laughs> it's the same thing in business. A struggling business is one thing. But once a business begins to boom, I'm telling you, it, 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 I've been broke when I went to seminary. I mean, I've been broke. I've been affluent, and I've been everything in the middle. I've been middle class, I've been lower middle class, I've been upper middle class, and I was a kid before I let the Holy Spirit con me into going to the mission field. I was rich. <laughs> Money creates as many problems as it solves, doesn't it? Talk to somebody who became affluent who went from a working class or middle, a lower middle class background and became upwardly mobile. Money creates as many problems as it solves. <laughs> Taxes, finance, management, wills, everything, the kids. Money creates as many problems as it's. Now, what a wonderful problem to have. I'd rather have the problem of, of, of how do you deal with the money than deal with the problem of not having any, but it's still a problem. Still a problem. There are, the, there are wealthy people who are miserable. I know, I know. I've known wealthy people who are absolutely miserable. <laughs> Unbelievable. So let's look. Growth will create a scenario that predisposes us to interpersonal conflict, what we should or should not do and how we should do it. And even though you may not be party to it, you'll be drawn into it. Now, Abraham said, let there be no strife between us. <laughs> A godly split, an amicable split, is better than a hostile schism. An amicable split is better than a hostile one. Okay? That's where it's esteeming others better than yourself. What do you want? You, you, make, you, you pick what you want. I'll, I'll just trust the Lord for whatever. That's always better than the other way. But if the other way happens, it wasn't just a case where, what do you want? I'll do this, I'll do that. It was the question of, is this guy fit for the ministry of, of, of a mission? And then the family relations got into it. And the, oh my. Quite a mess. And of course, the devil always has a hand in these things, doesn't he? Now, what's important to remember is the Canaanite and the Perizzite were in the land. We have to read this on the background of Genesis 9.25 and on the curse of Canaan. The Canaanites were a wicked, wicked civilization. They practiced human sacrifice, bestiality, and all kinds of unspeakable things that was interrelated with their pagan worship. Remember, the real problem is not with each other. The problem is with the Canaanite. <laughs> it's the ungodly, those who are satanically animated, who are the real opponent. We shouldn't be fighting with each other. Well, in an ideal scenario, that's true. Genesis 13, we have one example. But Acts 15, it gets ugly. These are apostles. These are apostles, the foundation of the church. People who saw Jesus were personally trained by him, and they're splitting. Whoa, that's a big mess. If they fall out like that, <laughs> what's going to happen to us? Now understand, there are other kinds of division, not like this. There are divisions that are right. If a church grows, maybe you need to plant a new church for the people who live on that side of town. Maybe the Lord is going to use 
the friction within the fellowship to plant another church to reach more people with the gospel. It could be. That could be. If a home group gets more than 15 people, I'm telling you, once you get 15, 18 people, you need to seriously consider splitting it into two. Once you get up around 20 people, fellowship stops taking. Remember, in the early church, in the book of Acts chapter 2, they met house to house and in the temple. The same as you can do things in large groups you can't do in small ones, you can do things in smaller groups you can't do in larger ones. People are going to identify and develop their gifts in small groups, not big ones. And real fellowship will take place in smaller groups, not in large ones. The early Christians took the Lord's Supper in, in house to house. I'm not saying that it's wrong to take it in a larger group as well, but the real fellowship was in a small group in the early church. That was the principle. Okay. God could allow this friction to happen in order to bring about a split he wants. It's not necessarily bad. There comes a time for Barnabas to realize it's time for Saul, who's no longer Saul, but now Paul, to go his own way. That the work of the gospel will spread more robustly. Then we have the 1 Corinthians 11 type split. Look at it. Verse 19, for there must be factions among you to prove which is true, or in order that those who are approved may become evident among you. That word for factions in Greek is heresies, heresies, heresy. The Greek root of the word heresies, we get heresy, is the term irun. Irun, Irun, Eresis, Heresis. Okay. Irun means to take one thing out. <laughs> the real meaning of heresy is not just a doctrinal error. It's a doctrinal error that causes a schism. Let's look at Seventh-day Adventists. They take one thing out of context about the Sabbath. Okay. And they form a schism on that basis. That's heresy. You understand? That's, that's the meaning of the Greek word. Heresy is supposed to cause divisions. Now, the mainstream Christendom, as opposed to Christianity, they emphasize institutional unity, organizational unity of the church. The scripture doesn't. The scripture emphasizes unity of the spirit, one faith, one baptism. All you really need is a fellowship of fellowships. <laughs> once they no longer have the unity of the Spirit, once they're no longer one faith, one baptism, what they try to do is supplement, or in fact, not just augment, but replace the unity of the Spirit with an organizational unity. It becomes something legal and financial and administrative. Their basis of unity becomes a superannuation fund for the retirement of ministers and property trusts and things like that. They become institutionalized. They become an organized religion, and that becomes their replacement for the unity of the spirit. Doctrine becomes secondary. It all becomes administrative, legal, and financial. That's what tends to happen in denominations. And they're so anxious to preserve this kind of unity they have because it's about money and property and things like that. Oh, man. They have the same motives as the world. It's not supposed to be like that. Once somebody goes into a fundamentally wrong doctrine and will not repent of it, there is a biblical basis for unity. We do not stay united with people who go into heresy. But we're not talking about any of that stuff. We're not talking about planting a new church. 
We're not talking about a senior pastor having to accept the fact that his assistant is now ready to pioneer on his own under the Lord's guidance. We're not talking about separating from false brethren or true churches separating and leaving a denomination from, 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 from heretical ones. All that stuff's easy to deal with, at least easy to understand how to deal with it. Now we're talking about two good guys. And it's not working out the way it did with Abram and Lot. <laughs> it's getting really nasty. And they split. Who was right and who was wrong? Was Barnabas right or was Paul right? Oh, if they had humility and just prayed. You don't think they knew that? They were apostles. Who's right or who's wrong? Well, let's find out who was right and who was wrong. Look with me, please, to 2 Corinthians 1.18. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. <laughs> somebody's got to be right and somebody's got to be wrong. You're both right and wrong. It's not yes and no. Uh-oh. We got a problem here. Paul says things became really, really bad. He said things became so tough that they despaired of life. On the second missionary journey, Paul and his team, Silas and those guys who were with him, Paul says, we despaired of life. Can you imagine Paul wanting to die? Lord, just get me out of here. I can't take this anymore. Now again, if he reached the end of his rope, <laughs> who can't? It's obvious that John Mark could not have handled it. Paul almost couldn't handle it. By the time they got to Philippi, they thought they had a breakthrough, and he wound up in jail. Then there was more rejection in Thessalonica, a bit of an acceptance in Berea, but he gets to Athens, and the intellectuals, most of them didn't want to know, and then he goes to Las Vegas, Corinth. The span of life, he says. If John Mark couldn't handle the first missionary journey, there's no way John Mark could have handled the second missionary journey. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, Thalipsis, tribulation, which came upon us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so we despaired even a life. <laughs> Paul said we just couldn't handle it anymore. We were burdened beyond our strength. Now it's true to say that God will not allow us to be burdened beyond our strength without giving us the grace to cope with it, but it goes beyond our own capacity to deal with it. It can go, it can exceed our own capacity to deal with it. Mission fields can be tough. You don't send amateurs to mission fields. One of the most unscriptural organizations on the face of the earth that I wish didn't exist is Youth with a Mission. You don't send people saved three months into foreign countries. Now, now they're telling people in the Pacific you can call Jesus by the name of Io Pele, the Hawaiian volcano god. Before missionaries came to Hawaii, they were throwing infants into the lava to placate Pele to stop them. 
Now, now that's Jesus. This is youth with the mission, completely messed up organization. Taking people, save three, four months, and sending them to, to no. this, they were fasting and praying in Antioch, and the spirits had set out for me, Barnabas and Saul. You send your veterans, you, you don't send amateurs. It's just not scriptural. It is not scriptural. It's no wonder you that the mission is off the wall. Theologically, their whole model is on scripture, is contrary to scripture. But now let's look at this. Now I'm not talking about don't send your youth group down to Guatemala to build a Sunday school in the summer. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really sending people as missionaries to other cult cultures, cross culturally, and things like that. Oh boy, this is heavy duty. Paul says, look, this guy bailed out at Pergamum. He bailed out the first time. He couldn't handle the dry run. There's no way we can take him into Asia and then into Europe. No way. This guy can't do it. He's not up to it. And Barnabas is saying, you know, he bailed out, but he's young. Look, he's good stock. We've got to give him another shot. We've got to encourage him. You know. There is no question that missiologically, Paul was absolutely right. From the perspective of a missionary, Paul was right. But now let's look further. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him. Bring him with you. He's useful to me for service. And Paul goes on how Demas, having loved this world, deserted him and gone to Thessalonica and Christians has gone to Galatia and all this. All these other guys bailed out. Get me John Mark. He's useful. I can rely on him. The same guy who we said he's useless. We can't trust him. Now things are tough again in 2 Timothy. This is the low ebb emotionally of Paul's ministry. I need somebody I can rely on. I need somebody who's useful, who I can trust, who's not going to take off, who's not going to abandon. Get me that, get me that John Mark. This is the same guy. Who he said, you can't rely on. Now he says, get him here. He's reliable. Look at Philemon. Verse 24. My fellow prisoner in Christ greets you. As do Mark, <laughs> Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. The same guy who bailed out on them when things got tough, who couldn't handle it, who Paul says we can't bring. Now, he's a kingpin. Now, he's a linchpin. Now he's somebody we know we can trust and rely on. He's going to be there. He's going to hang in there when things get tough. Pastorally, Barnabas was right. From the perspective of a missionary, Paul was right. But from the perspective of a pastor, Barnabas was right. Paul says our answers are not yes and no. Our answers are yes and yes. <laughs> they were both right. Again, the dynamics of the church have much in common, or at least parallel, to human dynamics. A pastor is going to see things more pastorally. That doesn't mean he's going to ignore a doctrine, but he's going to see things more pastorally. A missionary and evangelist are going to see things missiologically or evangelistically. It's going to be the gospel that drives them. A teacher is going to be driven by doctrine. Somebody with prophetic ministry is going to look at things prophetically. Everybody's going to see things from a different aspect. 
doesn't mean they're blind to the other aspects, but it means that <coughs> their own calling is going to predominate their perspective. I prayed for a Jewish lady in New York, a believer, <coughs> very, very ill. A lot of things wrong with her last week in New York. Well, she goes to all these doctors and hospitals and things. God bless her. For her vision, you know, the ophthalmologist is more concerned with their eyes, you know. The GYNOB is more concerned with the hysterectomy. She was jaundiced. Dermatologist is more concerned with her skin. They were all right. But they just tend to see it from their perspective. It's not yes and no, it's yes and yes. It's no different than the church. From the point of view of a missionary, Paul was absolutely right. This guy can't come. From the point of view of a pastor, Barnabas was absolutely right. We got to give this guy another shot. He has potential. He should have went with Barnabas to Cyprus. He should not have come with Paul, but he should not have been left out of the ministry. They were both right. The test of spirituality is not that these differences will not emerge from time to time. The test of spirituality and fellowship and Christ-centeredness is not that these things won't happen. It's the way we handle them when they do. <laughs> it's the way we handle them when they do. We have to understand Again, the teacher sees it doctrinally. The evangelist sees it evangelistically. You know, the pastor sees it past. Only Jesus sees all of it. And he sees the end from the beginning. You can't look at it. It's the way it is. Now, black and white, somebody's right, somebody's wrong. That's different. I have no doubt, had it been a major doctrinal issue or a moral issue, that Paul and Barnabas would have been of one accord. But when you're dealing with relationships and ministry, and especially when family, there's a family factor involved, it gets quite nebulous. It's rarely black and white. It's invariably some shade of gray. And it's not necessarily a case where one is right and one is wrong. It may be a case where they're both right, but you just can't see it at that time. Only God can see it. Well, let's go back to Acts 15 now. It was all settled, these four things. The Gentiles, no idolatry, no strangled food. Not just cruelty to animals, but it had a pagan association. Jews had to sacrifice animals in the shikla. Uh, shikla. Uh, <coughs> the blood had to be let in a way that there would be no cruelty to the animal when they slaughtered an animal. Um, obviously, no immorality and no consumption of blood. The Roman Catholic doctor of transubstantiation is nonsense. It's not real blood, but they think it is. Don't drink the Roman communion. We are forbidden to consume ritual consumption of blood. That's a vampire religion. <coughs> Remember, Roman Catholicism is a cannibalistic religion. <coughs> Actually believe under the appearances of bread and wine that that's the protoplasm of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not real cannibalism organically, but they think it is. Does anybody not understand what I'm saying? Does anybody want me to explain the Roman Eucharist quickly? <coughs> they took John 6 out of context, unless you eat my flesh or drink my blood. If you read in context, Jesus says, a few verses later, the flesh profits nothing. <laughs> He's speaking of eating as believing, okay? The word became flesh. You eat the word. Remember Ezekiel 2, you had to eat the scroll. John chapter 10, you had to eat the scroll. Um, Jeremiah 17, eat the, eating the word, eating is believing. That's the background of John 6. 
the Last Supper, this is my body. But what Jesus would have said was, do this in remembrance of me. It's a memorial, like the Jewish Passover. The Last Supper was a Paschal Seder, Jewish Passover. It's a memorial. But they eat at Jezebel's table. They get into this cannibalistic religion where you're actually eating him physically. Okay. Well, they couldn't explain this, and it became an issue philosophically with the church fathers and onward until they got to the Aristotelianism of Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas followed Aristotle, Aristotle's philosophy of so-called accidents, quote-unquote. Something could appear to be something, but it's actually different. Like sodium chloride, table salt. Well, it looks like table salt, and it tastes like table salt, but we really know it's chlorine and sodium. They didn't understand about chemical reactions, about electrons shifting between shells. So therefore, you know, uh, well, it looks like a pen. It writes like a pen, but that's only its accidents, its appearances. It's actually a cigar. Give me a light, Charlie. You understand? That is how the Roman Catholic Church believes in transubstantiation. Now, of course, Aristotle's philosophy of accidents was debunked by modern chemistry and physics. Nonetheless, in Roman Catholicism, it's known as the De Fede Doctrine. Their constitutional motto is Sempre Eden. They can't change it, even though it's scientifically disproven. They'll tell you we accept it's Jesus' body and blood by faith. But their actual doctrine is they don't believe it by faith. They chemically and organically think that's what it is. You understand? Because of this debunked primitive view of chemistry and physics that came from alchemy, from, you know, magic. Well, let's conclude. Everything should have been settled doctrinally. Everything should have been settled doctrinally in Acts 15 about this issue. Once the apostles agreed, that put a lid on the problem. Now we can move on, I wish. In conclusion, look at Galatians 2. Verse 11. But when Cephas, the Latinization of the Aramaic Kaifa, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For well, prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, and the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy. <laughs> Another problematic passage for Roman Catholicism. They say the apostles were the first bishops and that Peter was the first pope. When was the last time you saw a bishop standing up in public and telling the pope that he's behaving like a hypocrite? <laughs> These were apostles now. The doctrinal issue was settled. But people still behaved in accordance with the social pressures and prejudices. Now, when politicians do this, you expect it, nothing personal. They have to agree with whoever they're talking to, especially at election time. But Christians shouldn't be like that. Doctrinally, they would have said one thing, but their behavior reflected another. These were apostles. Even they blew it. They knew Jesus. They saw the when it was a black and white doctrinal issue, Paul was right, end the story. But when it's a relational issue, <laughs> Paul was right, Barnabas was right. But they said two different things. Yeah, but they're both right. That's just the way it is. If it can happen to the apostles, nobody is immune. This problem will affect you at some point. Your church, your ministry, your relationships with other Christians, 
it is inevitable that that kind of problem is going to happen. At the time, in the circumstance, you can only see your point of view. But they're both right, and they were both proven right. Paul acknowledged Barnabas was right. He said, send me this guy who bailed out, because I know he won't bail out. <laughs> Barnabas was right as a pastor. We despaired of life. Paul was right as a missionary. It just doesn't always work the way we want to. Sometimes sick people are prescribed drugs that are contraindicated. The nephrologist doesn't want you to take this. It's bad for your kidneys, but the cardiologist says you have to. <laughs> That's the way a body works. Or it doesn't work. It's going to happen. When it happens, the real issue is not that it's happening. The real issue is how we handle it when it does. God bless and thank you.